I have a memory as a child of staring at a dead bird that I'd buried long before, but dug back up. My mom had no idea what I was talking about when I asked her if all of great grandpa was in heaven yet. I had observed the decaying process, the slow disappearance, and assumed it implied an equal gradual reemergence in the hereafter. Years later, my mom told the story herself, and I began to think it wasn't even my memory, but something I originated in my mind based on her telling many years before. As a kid, I also noticed how over the years, many of our home movies had slowly become memories of mine. Oh yeah, I remember playing in that little inflatable pool. Not really, I wasn't even two years old. It was a home movie of my sisters and me shot by my dad. Maybe this conflation of film, time, and memory was the early protoplasm of the idea of boyhood. I wanted the movie to seem like a memory of a young life just rolling through time. The best analogy of how memory works that I have ever read is that it's closer to a theatrical production than a movie or video. Instead of pushing the rewind and play button or watching that exact piece of film again, you're actually restaging the event in your mind based on your recollection of the last time you conjured that particular memory. Maybe over time, you've recast the parts a little or given it a slightly different setting. Inevitably, there might be a few new elements glommed onto it based on the circumstances of what else you were recalling from your last production of that particular memory. I find it a beautifully unnerving thought that this story and all of our heads, this narrative of our lives that we find ourselves cast in and playing until we can't any longer, is more imaginative than technically real. And like being pulled into a movie, we have no choice but to accept it as the only reality we know in the moment. So a movie of memories, but which ones exactly? With such a vast 12-year canvas spread out before us, the question was what exactly to fill it in with. There could be all the big events and firsts of a maturing person, but why were so many of those moments for me now residing in some dusty file with the label reading, yes, I remember, but kind of boring and not very original? And why were so many random, seemingly inconsequential moments having such extended long runs in my memory? Why could I still feel and see certain things from several decades before as if they were ever present? The looks on people's faces, the conversation, the exact lighting, tone and energy of the day, good things, bad things, funny things, all there in the same place. That seemed like the right place to start. It would be personal, yet I knew it would transform into something else entirely via its interplay and collaboration with not only a contemporary setting, but also through the memories and experiences of my cast. Boyhood is that restaging with a new cast and setting. And every year, a parallel project was taking place. Unlike the film, which embodies the passing of time, Matt Lanka's stills and portraits capture something very different. Single moments suspended in time. You would look around on the set and there was Matt with his camera shooting behind the scenes photos and with his impromptu black portrait booth grabbing everyone for a few precious minutes. I've really been looking forward to the day all his work, this long-term photographic project, could be viewed as one collection. And I'm so glad this book exists as a gallery of his portraits and a testament to the memories that we created in the making of Boyhood. As I write these thoughts in September of 2014, the film is still in theaters and it hasn't even been a year since we shot the last scene. I'm not sure we've all even wrapped our heads around the fact that we're not shooting again this year. I wonder how it will feel 12 years from now when the movie has moved farther and farther from the present. When the Patricia, Ethan, Eller, and Lorelei on screen, even at the end of the movie, become depictions of much younger versions of themselves. I initially had the idea when I came on during the filming of year two, when Kathleen was the producer and she hired me on to do the stills. And I saw this opportunity to do portraits in the style that I like to do. So I just approached Rick and Kathleen and said, hey, I would love the opportunity to make these pictures year after year in the same situation, background, and keep it consistent. And they were both like, that's a great idea. And I had worked with Rick on Fast Food Nation and done the exact same thing, so he was familiar with my work. So initially, that's how it kind of came about. I am growing up. The first time I watched the movie, Mason's point of emotional development essentially led into my current state. 
And every time I watch the film, I am a little farther from that person. This film has always been a reflection of life and an outlet to explore my own emotional journey through this alternative universe. I've always played a character, as most people do, one who is very different from Mason. Almost all my life I've been building this character to stand in place of my uncertainty, but now I see that this character is just as fictional as Mason. I think we are not the masks that we create and that we crave genuine emotional interaction beyond the sensational cliches of modern pop culture and that the magic we seek to escape into can already be found all around us in our flawed human lives. There's beauty in the mundane. Richard Linkletter called me out of nowhere. We'd met briefly a few years before at a film reception. I was a fan and told him so. And I think we may have even talked about my young son. He was already a father, and I was already a mother. I'd had my son at 20. My son and I grew up together. When Richard called me about the movie, my son was 12, and I'd lost both my parents. I'd watched my son's infancy and early years blur by. I'd married and divorced. I was dragging around the corpse of a failed marriage. I was mourning my mother. I was mourning my father, and with their deaths, I found some distance on the parenting mistakes I felt they'd made. By then, I'd made plenty of mistakes of my own to reflect on. By then, I'd missed them. I could no longer take them for granted. My mom said once she thought her personality started at the sink. Not literally, but I think she meant a part of her was invisible, as if her life was a series of actions of servitude. When Richard first told me about boyhood, Everything in my body said yes. When he told me about my character, Olivia's trajectory, it was strangely familiar. Both of our mothers had gone back to school. Both of our mothers had gone on to teach. My adolescence was full of memories of her buried in her bed surrounded by paperwork. In her time of dying, her house was full of people I'd never met. Strangers came to tell me how she had changed their lives to thank her. A friend of hers said to me, you die like you live. Let's go. My mother, like a thousand mothers, was largely taken for granted. The woman we all know, the invisible woman. My mother, the world's most horrible cook. My mother, who never wore makeup, who never taught me that being a woman was supposed to be about being beautiful. My mother, who carried the name Olivia, which is why when Rick asked me what my character's name should be, I chose that name. My mother, who made mistakes but loved us always. She learned so much, changed so much in my lifetime. She'd grapple with the Gordian knot of balancing her nurturing instincts and codependency. My mother, who died far too young. It was a privilege to take care of her while she was dying as she'd taken care of me, a debt I could never fully repay. If you are there for your kids and you love them, they may take care of you when you need them most. I guess that's true. You die like you live. My father told me once that with each child came a gift. He said with every one of us, he fell more in love with our mom. With another, he had a great spiritual growth. With another, a work opportunity. The powerful impact a loving father can have is significant. A father who cares and accepts who you are is a blessing. Rick told me Ethan Hawke would be playing my ex-husband. I'd always wanted to work with Ethan. He and Richard carefully crafted a character, a well-thought-through, crafted evolution. Again, Ethan's father and Richard's father had both gone into the insurance business, had both found happiness in a second marriage. Ethan had 12 years to go from a man who drove a GTO to a man wearing a cheap suit driving a minivan. Ethan's Mason Sr. reminded me of my father, my charismatic, complicated, talented, and wild father the beautiful father who'd been beguiled by the specter of freedom, a man bisected, seeing the gifts and the privilege of being present for your kids and the great adventure that lay in wait just outside, loving and needing his children for who they were for his own growth. He seemed to want to be free and bound all at the same time. There is a trade-off. There is. Sometimes we find in adulthood that we are different than we thought we would be, this life will largely give you free choice. The master you choose to serve is up to you. 
If you're willing, it will also show you the woods to lose yourself in. Still, the woods can be a lonely place. If you're lucky enough and life is forgiving enough, it may also point you to the road back home. When Eller was little, he was not the obvious choice most directors would make. He was dreamy and had no interest in catering to what adults thought. He was an original thinker. He was creative. He was also at times quiet and an observer. We see this boy in our families and in our lives, but we seldom see this character in film. He grew into a powerful and graceful man. He became a wonderful collaborator. To see the man he became and the boy he was, Richard and Eller worked closely through the years. Rick never wanted Eller to have a first experience on film. When Eller told Rick he had a girlfriend, Rick knew it was time to add that into the story. He was always genuine on film and genuine in real life. It's one thing making a movie. It's another dealing with the oddity of the world critiquing you. Eller's moved through this process with maturity I could have never possessed at his age. Lorelai cast herself in the movie. Rick says when she learned there was a part of an older sister, she claimed the part. Rick incorporated Lorelai's inventive language, her mouth popping responses to her mother. Her character was pragmatic, a perfect foil for Mason Jr.'s dreaminess. She brought a no-nonsense, no-bullshit element. Her Samantha was a born realist. She would question choices if she didn't believe them. Coming from a generation where girls were not really supposed to stand up for themselves, it's great to see our daughters can have some of what Samantha has. Lorelai was and is honest. I actually hate this assignment. It's further proof that I will no longer take the last flight to Austin. I will no longer meet Rick, Ethan, Lorelai, and Eller at a hotel for a late brainstorming rehearsal. I will no longer come to the set to see our beautiful crew, who I've come to know year after year. I will no longer see them right before they get married or hug them after they get divorced. I will no longer see their bellies swell with babies. I won't get to run away from Matt with his camera while he tries to document this, or volley questions from Kathleen. I will no longer see these people I've come to care so much about every year. I'm very grateful to this movie, to this experience, which I can say was perfect. I never thought I would be part of something so human. I know I will never have another experience like this, to make a movie where it is more about the process than the product, where the life of every person you've met folds back in on itself and finds its way in small increments into the film. Most people never have a chance to work with a filmmaker so brave and intimate, to be part of a love letter to the middle class. I'm still sad it's over. I'm reminded of one of my favorite moments in the movie. It's at the end. It's a two shot of Mason and Nicole, and he's just said, it's always right now. And then with his gaze, he breaks the third wall. He smiles into the camera. This movie seems almost like a documentary, but in that moment, he invites the audience in, telling you, yes, this is your movie too. This is our movie, a movie about all of us. I guess I have no right to mourn this process ending as it was never really mine alone to hold. Since the moment I met him, which was shortly after the release of Slacker, Richard Linkletter has been deeply in touch with his own voice, never imitating or copying. From the start, he challenged my generation to ask, what do we have to contribute that will be original or unique to us? He's never been interested in any of the fruits of perceived success, but has always clearly had his eye on how little time we have to be alive and the value there is in living an explored life. As someone who has watched the last 20 years of his creative life, from both the collaborator's seat and the easy chair of friendship, he has forced me to reevaluate almost all my ideas of movies, which was pretty much limited to Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars when we first met. Once in passing, he said, Kerouac, Bukowski, and Cassavetes are all responsible for inspiring more bad art than anyone else, because the second anybody encounters their work, it looks so simple that they think they could do it themselves. See, and I think Rick is the same way. He makes telling a story so effortless, casual, and accidental that one imagines that there's no real craft involved. Like Bukowski just wakes up in the morning and burps an elegiac poem, or Cassavetes just turns a camera on his wife, or Kerouac takes a drive and comes back with a novel. Linkletter seems to just whip up a film. 
Sometimes people approach me full of these notions of how Julie Delpy and I must have improvised the whole Before trilogy and seem disappointed when they find out how meticulously prepared and rehearsed all three films were. Yes, even the eccentricity and seemingly accidental behavior was all mapped out, dissected, and discussed. With almost every one of Rick's movies that I've done, I've heard people say, oh yeah, I had that idea, or I was going to make a movie like that. The central ideas of his most personal work are kind of straightforward. Slacker, Days and Fuse, Waking Life, Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, Before Midnight, and Boyhood all have a unique relationship with time. They're not about story, plot, or entertainment. They are about us, human beings, and our relationship to the space and time we inhabit. Somehow, they manage to very mysteriously be entertaining. He seems to actually like people, and in turn, he shows us that despite our constant complaining, we actually like living. I had made three films with Rick when he had first approached me with the idea of boyhood. There was no script. None of the film was really fleshed out. It was just an idea he presented to me. It was a sketch in his mind, a film about childhood in the tradition of Tolstoy's book Childhood, Boyhood, and Youth. I remember him saying something like, I want to make a film about growing up, and why can't we approach it more like writing a novel? Take our time, shape it, and tweak it as the characters and the world change. The second he offered me the opportunity to play the father in the film, I had the thought that I was being offered a chance that no other actor had ever been offered, to shape a character's emotional growth authentically using time as our tool. Yes, Chekhov and Stanislavski would rehearse plays over years, but the actor and character aging simultaneously had, to my knowledge, never been done inside one fictional film. And as Boyhood took shape over the first eight or nine years, it began to have a kind of gravitational pull on my soul. I remember one year being so disappointed that I was told I was only going to appear via FaceTime. I loathed technology that day. I wanted to interact with my son. People often ask me, was it hard to carve out the time? But what they don't know is how much I began to long for a chance to continue to flesh out this character. Rick would tell me, well, Dad's just taking up less space in his kid's life. It stung like being a father does in real life. When my last day of shooting finally came, it was surreal to finish a project that I had begun before I was divorced, before I was remarried, before three of my children were born. Learning my lines, I tried to imagine how I would have played my last scene, taking my son out after he graduates from high school, differently had I been asked to play it back on the first day of shooting when I was only 32. I think I probably would have overdone it, dyed my hair gray, put a pillow in my gut, walked with a limp. I would have imagined the 12 years passing with much more blunt force trauma. Something big must have happened by then. And of course, looking back, it had. But each individual day passed so subtly that for me and my character, it never seemed anything grand was happening. But that is where the sharpness of the film and Matt's work with these photos takes its focus. The story harnesses the power of time and lets those powerful horses pull us along. Its simplicity is the special effect. And all of that was imagined and patiently crafted by Richard Linklater. And when I watch the film now, it looks and feels so much like the film he sketched out to me over coffee more than a decade ago. And it all looks so easy. Seeing the familiar faces year after year and watching them age in front of my lens, the subtle changes with the passage of time is captivating for me as a photographer. We all grew older in front of and behind the camera on this film, cast and crew alike. I might win the award for the most gray. Making the commitment to such a long project was easy, not really having a concept of the time it would require. Then, after a few years, I looked at the images collected so far and became excited by it all, looking forward to the final volume of work. Photographing all of the talented actors and crew members was a moving experience, especially working so closely with Eller. He has always been a very sweet person, and I loved that he had an interest in photography. Eller and his mom would ask to shoot with me on occasion. We would meet somewhere in Austin and walk around for a few hours, street shooting, wandering with the wind. One particular moment that stays with me is the darkroom scene. We were filming at the same high school in Austin where I had been a student in the exact darkroom where I had first learned to develop film and make enlargements. It was a flood of memories for me, and I tried to impart that importance to Eller. I think he got it. Being involved with the making of Boyhood was an incredible adventure that I will always treasure. We are continuing to shoot his annual 4x5 black and white portrait. Having completed year 13, I look forward to many more.
For me, Boyhood is a film about a single mom raising her kids and facing the inevitable abandonment by her college-bound child, fiction, that saved this single mom from falling to pieces when inevitably her own college-bound child abandoned her, real life. It's not really abandonment, I know this, of course, but the pain felt the same. To lose your child is to lose a part of your very DNA. It doesn't matter if it's only to the other side of the country. Portland felt like it would be on my gravestone. I started working on boyhood in its second year. My brother Matt, the one three years younger, the one I might have thought of as Tiger Kibble when we first met, came on with me as the set photographer. Our mother is in the bowling alley scene, almost a cameo for her in her own pink vintage bowling shirt and where she has played on a league for years. My daughter, six months younger than Eller, was an extra multiple times popping up throughout the film. Her precious face over the years like Easter eggs waiting for me to find, even though I know exactly where they are. Production took on an air of summer camp or a family reunion, perhaps. Cast and crew formed a second family, forged by the level of commitment to the project, bound to see it to its end. Each year passed successfully, the challenges wrangled and conquered, and a huge weight off my mind. Each year passed and my daughter grew older, the thought of her eventual departure my own burden to hold. I was raising my child while raising a film, and the inevitable conclusion would be the culmination of both. When I left her, Nicolette, in Portland, I called her from the airport. Somehow I had it in my mind that this was it, the end of conversation, the last chance to speak with her before the task was complete and I was on a plane home to Austin, to a house she would not be in. I couldn't hear well through all my tears, tears that had begun that morning when the hotel waitress had handed me the menu and asked how I was doing, tears that I thought might never end. Nicolette's reassurances felt almost rehearsed or wishful, but we take what we can get. When I recounted this all later to Rick, he thought it was hilarious, so he and Patricia put it in the scene when Mason goes off to college. Filming it I thought might be tough. Our production designer, Rodney, a good friend, was ready for me to faint or fall into spasms or some altered state of tragedy. I was prepared. I was steel. Then we got on a bus two hours later and headed to West Texas. The last scene in the film is the last we shot with the cast, with Mason and Nicole sitting looking over the slowly setting sky, the colors and the vastness of West Texas all around. We were all looking out at that sky, feeling that final moment that in truth is just a beginning. It wasn't until months later, screening the film again for the fourth time and watching Patricia's exquisite performance, the hero song swelling up as Mason leaves her in her despair, the lyrics finally seeping into me. Let me go, I don't want to be your hero. I don't want to be a part of your parade. Everyone deserves a chance to walk with everyone else. Then the tears came again. The cascade of love and the knowing. I knew what she wanted from me. And again, I could hear her voice telling me, it's okay, mom. It's all going to be okay. I just want to fight with everyone else. You're a masquerade. I don't want to be a part of your parade. Everyone deserves a chance to Walk with everyone else While holding down A job to keep my 